Hi there. Welcome back to Sky Gazing. This is Gayatri Jayaraman, your host. Today I'm reading Women Who Wear Only Themselves by Arundhati Subramanian. It's a book published by Speaking Tiger in 2021. It's essentially an account of the author's personal encounters with four women mystics: Shri Annapurni Amma, Bala Rishi Vishwarasini, Lata Mani, and Ma Karpuri. Each account is interspersed with the author's own poetry. Women are no strangers to the spiritual path in a country as spiritually diverse as India. And this book has been a long time coming. In fact, it's something that I have also been searching for. Because when you shift out of the material plane of traveling India into a spiritual seeking of its uh, richness, of its experiences, Uh, you begin to encounter people specifically women practitioners seekers mystics uh you know diversity that is just simply breathtaking i remember i was in amarkantak at the source of the narmada river in late 2018 and i was just sitting at the tank in the temple when i suddenly noticed that i was surrounded by as many women mystics as men if not more each one had her own specific corner of the tank and was lost in meditation uh, i had a long conversation at that time with brahmacharini chinmay who could not have been more than 45 or 50 and who had left her home her husband a mother-in-law a son back home in the 24 paragnas in west bengal and come here to live in a tent without electricity or running water uh, on the ramghat where she had now lived for around 20 years and i remember having this conversation with her where i asked her how can you call yourself a brahmacharini when you have been married and you do have a child and she spent over an hour explaining to me the true meaning of brahmacharya it is not the uh, physical engagement she said that makes you a brahmacharya or a brahmacharini but is it is the virginity of the soul of the consciousness of knowing and when your soul is ready for that journey you will step out of the engagement with the world on the material plane on the cognitive plane into a divinely granted spiritual innocence and that is your brahmachari and uh, these are experiences that are available to you wherever you go in india uh, you know on the ghats of varanasi you can speak to a shopkeeper who will give you this kind of uh, you know beautiful insight i've said it in one of my earlier podcasts uh, when i reached kashi and i saw the ganga the shopkeeper standing there who i was talking to told me he said do you know why the ganga is said to flow backwards in kashi and i said no why and he said because until now you have lived your life from birth to death but once you have come to kashi and seen the ganga you begin to live your life backwards from death to birth because now you know what is important and what is inevitable so this is the richness of the indian spiritual experience that is available across the country and uh, it was specifically when i was reading uh, apprentice to a himalayan master by shri m who is basically a man born into a muslim family who begins his spiritual quest 
at times having to hide his identity the identity of his birth and his origin uh in a setup that you know chooses to only feed or, or house <coughs> people who are born into brahmin families but of course he makes his way and uh finds his master his guru and he begins his quest or rather continues his quest from a previous life time and i remember reading that and just feeling extremely disappointed that um this kind of seeking this kind of structure was not available to women who decided to leave everything and and move on because you see even as you walk along the rivers of north india towards the himalayas you will find dharamshalas set up at intervals such that the distance is timed for men to arrive at them by nightfall so they can get a meal and a bed and start walking again the next morning it is so organized um and there are very few of those for women uh so essentially if women are already at the fringe of mainstream society the women seekers at the fringe of that society and the women seeker within the organized structure at ashrams of organized religion are still sort of protected by the umbrella network of centers disciplines rules maryada the segregation of men and women that confers a certain amount of safety but the women even outside this fringe who must operate as complete paragis tyagis wandering mystics to them they have to f- create their own map of india they have to come up with their own um sort of landscape rule structures and this is what arundhati sort of taps into uh when you go through the uh, mahayana traditions of green tara you encounter this determination to gain liberation only in the female form and uh this is one of the reasons why because just in the simple enumeration of spaces for the woman mystic and the wandering seeker um the woman's experience is self explored self wrought self defined and therefore the experience of each woman seeker is as unique as a divine thumbprint and yes there is space for the woman in in indian spirituality right from andal to akka mahadevi to mirabai and bahina bai arundhati is very careful to make this distinction between the women within the protection of the mainstream within the protection of organized religion and the woman mendicant as a sort of soloist on her own spiritual adventure and that path is very different that expression is very different and the reaction to it is also very different because you see in this sort of consumerist society where the nakedness of women is a sort of tool um used to titillate and sell everything from uh cars to toothbrushes it can only be hinted at but when a woman decides to own her own nakedness a spiritual mendicant a practitioner an avaduta and she says here i am ashamed of nothing it creates a lot of rage in people she gets labeled a prostitute a whore a mad woman and therefore she sort of takes on this veneer of the exaggerated the flamboyant seeking uh and escapes under that label of the mad woman you know she's mad she doesn't know what she's doing let her be and that in itself is a protection uh i'm fleetingly reminded she says of a novel in my childhood and its figure of the mad woman in the attic the archetype that women even today keep safely locked up unleashed from their psychological garrets these energies can be decidedly unsettling for the world and yet one knows that the refusal to draw on these attic reserves can turn one into a limited version of oneself often toothless lifeless insipid 
Charlotte Bronte, that 19th century creator of the mad woman in the attic, surely knew that too. There is something exhilarating about this presence before us. For a naked woman sadhu, I realize the mad woman demeanor is probably both liberating and convenient. It keeps at bay the spiritual tourists and curiosity hunters. And she goes into the, um, you know, the history also of women mystics in India. Uh, she says, you know, of course, uh, tracing the history of the Avadutas. Um, and she says the subcontinent has seen its celebrated women Avadutas as well. The 12th century naked ascetic Akka Mahadevi is widely known in southern India for her poetry of extraordinary richness and lyrical abandon. Her outpourings, which constitute some of the finest work of Kannada literature, offer glimpses of her wanderings through the countryside, drenched in a state of exalted awakening. I have Maya for mother-in-law, the world for father-in-law, and I cannot cross the sister-in-law. But I will give this wench the slip and go cuckold my husband with Hara, my lord, she declares. Lal Dev, the 14th century Kashmiri mystic, is another figure who stands tall in the collective consciousness of this land. As a woman adept who shrugged off oppressive family ties, worldly possessions and clothing to walk the world alone. In a poem, she exclaims, My master gave me just one rule. Forget the outside. Get to the inside of things. I, Lala, took that teaching to heart. From that day, I've danced naked. Mirabai, ecstatic lover of Krishna, did not drop her clothes but stripped off much else in her legendary quest for freedom. People say, I'm mad. Mother-in-law says, the ruin of our clan, she sings. In what is now an immortal anthem to sacred depravity. Janabai, the 13th century poet and maid servant in the home of the great Varkari Saint Namdev, was empowered by the same lunacy to invite her personal god Vithala, to wash her hair and do the dishes in her jauntily irreverent verse. I eat God, I drink God, I sleep on God, she says, in poetry that displays a breathtakingly casual relationship with, with the divine. A more recent example is the colorful 20th century South Indian mystic Mayama. Shriyam also uh, references Mayama in, in his writing. Uh, and if you're interested, do, do go and read that account as well. Clad in rags, her hair unkempt, the wild woman of Kanyakumari was often seen laughing, wandering by the seashore, followed by a faithful pack of stray dogs. Believed to hail originally from Assam, Mayama herself never spoke of her antecedents. She had no home and was never heard to give any teaching. Whatever food came her way was shared with her dogs. Her behavior was bizarre by any standards, and yet it became apparent to her townsfolk that this was no ordinary woman. Her very glance was considered miraculously healing, and her silence eloquent in its power. Over time, the seaside tea shop owners began to pray for her to turn up at their door every morning. She would often snatch at least from their trays and feed her dogs, but if she chose to grace their shop, they were guaranteed a day of booming business. If she so much as appeared in one's line of vision, it was considered a blessing. There are countless undocumented figures of this kind. Indeed, the folk memory of every Indian hamlet still boasts of its homegrown avaduta, one who took that terrifying leap into a life without labels and lived on to remind us that coming apart can sometimes mean coming home. Once one has set off on the spiritual path of the mystic, the question then becomes, how does one find a guru? A guru is very easily found if you just join an existing order. But if you operate on this fringe, uh, 
where you are the individual directly liaising with the universal and as she points out not individualistic in your journey but sort of merging in the expanse of this collective universal spirit how do you begin to find your guru and that's a question that i think is an important leap motive in the book uh it's a question she poses to shri annapurni amma and you know she, the response is just beautiful and i wanted to read it to you the guru is the person you can never buy his compassion is extraordinary he won't change for you but he won't rest without transforming you his business is to mirror you to show you who you are he has taken birth for the simple reason don't treat him as a visitor don't shop for gurus once you meet him treat him as your very breath don't doubt him don't suspect him he knows your every move your every thought your every plan whatever path or by lane you take he is there at the other end waiting for you you think your guru doesn't know you're here oh he knows all right she laughs wildly the guru is a thief really she continues he's waiting to loot you to rob you of your very being your identity but so what what do you have that is really yours and never forget how much he loves you he waits for you eagerly like a dog loyal steadfast committed to your liberation that's how simple he is do you hear him barking away he is your dog don't forget that you are his master too but he works only if you hold him as your very life breath and once you do you realize he is tireless even the gods in their temples need their sleep but not the guru temple sanctums close at noon but the guru works around the clock don't judge him by his appearance his grand clothes or the absence of them his success or the absence of it his fancy lifestyle or the absence of it you exist because of his compassion he is the only one in the universe who is willing to take on your karma no one else will when my disciples ask me for guidance i point them to tata he is my guru i tell him surrender to him surrender your all he has never failed me once you have surrendered you need not go in quest of him he will come to meet you but how to surrender completely to the guru they ask i tell them it's simple just look at everyone as your guru that's one strategy that will never fail he'll never be able to get away the master wears many disguises once you look through the disguises you see him everywhere but don't delay when he opens the door for you enter don't hesitate enter now if the door shuts you do not know when you will get the next opportunity perhaps in another yuga another era Everyone finds the guru baffling. Every day he wears a new form, a new garb. One day he may travel in posh cars with silken garments. Another day he discards all of it and lives the life of a renunciate. One day he is exuberant and the next day taciturn. Don't try to figure him out with your intellect. It will be futile. How does a mother know why her infant weeps? not because of logic she knows by instinct approach your path by instinct you will recognize the guru effortlessly just remember no deals are possible here no agreements no contracts no guarantees there is only love and once you look at everyone with the gaze of love you see every creature is divine you start with cliches like the divine is love and god is love and you end up with the realization that love is all there is love is fine 
nothing else matters nothing else exists as you navigate the world that these women have created for them in their spiritual journeys on their quest from childhood to adulthood dealing with society parents um attachments liberating themselves from it you realize that they are just there is so much innocence um that they speak with and yet so much just native intuitive wisdom and that's probably why i am more drawn to um uh, the women mystics uh, anapurni amma bale rishi vishwarasni and ma karpuri over lata mani who's um ufra is still very intellectualized she still sort of struggling with the marxist feminist framework that uh, you know bears the hallmark of uh, education and intellectualization and all the conceptual traps that come with it and somewhere when i uh, look at the struggles and it's not like these women um since claim to be enlightened uh, buddhas they are also struggling with these concepts they are also learning uh, they are also sifting making their mistakes as they go um through their lives uh and um but it is uh, somewhere that insight the innocence of the insight that says uh it is when you divest yourself of everything that you have been schooled in that you sort of arrive at this very very subtle truth uh that is awe inspiring um and and the concerns that they deal with are very much of basic womanhood for instance uh the uh, reluctant guru who in her youth was known as the kit kat kit kat uh, swami uh, she talks about uh you know she says i see many women on this journey nowadays there are many on the path of shiva in particular it feels like a resurgence it feels like shiva wants to bless everyone irrespective of gender sect class caste faith there are no barriers when it comes to shiva and uh, arundhati in the book asks her have these barriers ever mattered to you personally and she responds personally ritual orthodoxy has never mattered to me especially rules about cleanliness and uncleanliness after the age of 15 it didn't matter to me whether i had my period or not i would still do my pujas once when preparing for guru puja i got my period i just cleaned myself and went on with it and in fact there was none of the pain that regularly accompanies my menstrual cycle A few years ago I was in Yamunotri when I got my period I wanted to take a dip and was upset not because I thought I was impure but just because it was inconvenient I prayed and I asked for guidance and it actually stopped but there was no religious taboo attached to it it was just a nuisance and I was grateful that I didn't get my period that month there is a certain beauty about the actual process of conducting a sacred rite whether it is a puja or a homa that to me is everything At that moment all ideas of gender become irrelevant. I am simply the owner of a body. There is no thought of awkwardness, of privilege, of superiority or inferiority or of beauty. And these kind of questions are what make this uh, quest uh these individual journeys so um you know inspiring, so engaging, so beautifully told. I don't know coming from a more spiritual a practitioner sort of background myself i do not personally find myself in a space of suspension of uh, you know belief um to me these i've i've seen many women like this so i guess um a more uh, a more cynical maybe rational studied reader might find some of these um, uh, inquiries a little um doubtful for instance as a mental health practitioner i do also find myself asking the question whether uh, these women have traumas in their lives that need to be addressed in through counseling but also and it's it's a question of trauma that arundhati also deals with in the book but also even within the mental health practice um the latest 
progressions of studies have uh, learned to distinguish between spiritual uh, insights and experiences and uh, delusions so those are not no longer intermingled um these are the kinds of questions that arundhati brings up how does one go about finding the guru um how does one frame rules for oneself uh you know in this self defined uh, quest and uh, also how does one balance being a householder and a monk um should one balance it should one go off into the deep end at either side and these are questions that i think as women we have asked uh, ourselves uh repeatedly uh and we also reject this wandering into the world because out of a sense of maybe fear um what is out there what are the structures how do we survive what will we have to cope with what about the material aspects of uh, the spiritual journey so this is a very inspiring book in that sense i highly recommend uh, that you read it if only to learn that there are no fixed ways of seeking there is no order that you are required to belong to except you know one that progresses very organically from your own um, seeking the parts about the guru is particularly uh, reminded me of uh, the shirdi satcharitra where uh, shirdi sai baba explains the role of the guru and i found that the most interesting part of this book um, she talks a lot about the divine feminine but as you read it at least for me i did not find it particularly leaning towards um, feminine or masculine because i think she reaches a place where the soul remains ungendered uh the fact that these women are both essential to this narrative as well as incidental i leave you with a poem this one is called remembering it begins with an epigraph from akka mahadevi friend when will i have it both ways be with him yet not with him Here's what I'm good at. When you're around, marinating. When you're not, remembering. Nostalgia is reflex, a spasm of cortical muscle. But this remembering isn't habit or even sentiment. This remembering is a slumbering. allowing main text to drift into marginalia weekday into holiday inhaling you as rumor as legend and suddenly as thing superbly empirical with your very own local scent of infinity let me follow river currents warm with sun the ambling story lines of green lotus stems and wooden boats let me be that tangle of moonbeam and plankton on a journey too pointless to be pilgrimage floating jamming just at some remembering isn't an art more an instinct knowing that there is nothing limited about body nothing peace me about detail nothing at all second hand about remembering thank you for listening i highly recommend uh, you read women who were only themselves by arundhati subramaniam published by speaking tiger in 2021 and uh, it's a useful jumping off point to contemplate your own journey and how far you're willing to take it and in what way is the stripping down of ourselves um of the ways in which the world intrudes on us especially as women uh is necessary for us to be able to progress on our path thank you again and i will see you soon